The Halcyon Lectures were endowed in 1790 as part of the legacy of the Anglican priest and Cambridge alumnus John Hulse. The original terms of his bequest specify that the lectures were to be given by, quote, a learned and ingenious clergyman, unquote, <laughs> from Cambridge, holding the degree of Master of Arts and under 40 years of age. <laughs> I hope it will not be considered indiscreet of me to note that our lecturer today, in common it must be admitted with all recent incumbents, does not meet the third of these criteria, which was long ago relaxed by the Court of Chancery. But a learned and ingenious clergyman, Professor Lord Williams, most certainly is, and we are delighted to have him as our Holstein lecturer. Please join me then in welcoming him as he continues his series on the theme, Christ and the Logic of Creation, with today's offering, Logos and Logoi, a Byzantine Breakthrough. Thank you very much indeed, and thank you for turning up this week after last week's exercise in absence and silence and <laughs> apophosis. <laughs> in the last lecture, I noted that the 4th century discussions about theology, especially the theology of the Trinity, left little or no space for compromise about the traditional divine qualities. If divinity were being ascribed to the word incarnate in Jesus, what was being ascribed to him was, without qualification, that set of transcendental qualities which were part of the grammar of divinity at the time. So if truly divine, the Logos is truly unchangeable, impassable, and so forth. And it's easy to present this simply in terms of a theological anxiety to preserve the metaphysical proprieties to be polite to God, as you might say. But I'm not sure that that's the case. I think that what's going on here, and I've hinted at this in earlier lectures, is less an anxiety about getting the philosophy right as such, than that anxiety which I've seen as running through quite a lot of the discussion, ancient, medieval and modern, an anxiety about ascribing a duality of finite agencies to Christ. In other words, an anxiety about what I've been calling the competitive model of divinity and humanity in Jesus. That there are two agencies in Jesus is one of the things that, in one way or another, most of the theologians of the early period want to challenge. And those negative attributes of God, what some people have called the uh, hegemony of the alpha privative, not this, not that, not the other, those negatives about God, particularly God's freedom from suffering, have to be safeguarded for this reason, to avoid two finite agencies jostling for space within the person of Jesus. But before moving on to look at what unfolded in the 4th and 5th centuries, a little bit as a preliminary to today's main subject, I just want to enter in brackets another little caution some debates about early and medieval Christology, some debates within contemporary discussion, seem to turn on the question of whether we should ascribe two consciousnesses to Jesus. And I just don't believe that there are any terminological equivalents for that in the early Christian period. Patristic writers don't think in terms of consciousness as we do. And I think, therefore, that to approach Cyril of Alexandria, or indeed Maximus the Confessor, asking, are we looking at one or two consciousnesses in the incarnate Jesus, is actually a serious error in understanding the way the language of the period works. So, what's happening at the end of the 4th and the beginning of the 5th centuries? Well, There are two options widely available in the period, as all the textbooks will tell you, and they're often associated with Antioch and Alexandria. Like all great textbook polarities, this is an almost completely misleading version of what actually happened, but let's work with it just for the moment to see what's going on. 
We need, certainly it seems, if we're talking about full divinity and full humanity in Jesus, we need some way of speaking about the difference between human agency and whatever else is going on in Jesus. That's to say, divine agency doesn't simply turn into human agency. The life of Jesus is not an episode in the life of Almighty God, as the life of, let's say, Zeus raping Ganymede is an episode in the life of a divine individual of another kind. And that sense that we have to maintain some differentiation around agency is what leads some of the theologians of this period, mostly but not exclusively in West Syria and Asia Minor, to begin from that duality. There are two agents, even if not two finite agents, in Christ. There's a human agent and there's a divine agent. They coincide, as it happens, in the visible form of Jesus of Nazareth on earth. They don't intermingle. Their qualities are not affected by each other. Each agency does what that agency naturally does. Divinity does divine things, and humanity does human things. The problem with that is that it tends to give you the impression that the agencies we're talking about are natures. Divine nature does divine things. Human nature does human things. But, just a moment, natures don't do things. Agents act. And that's one of the underlying conceptual problems in this particular solution. When Pope Leo the Great of Rome issues his famous synodical letter in the middle of the 5th century, he perhaps rather indiscreetly uses this language of nature's acting without too much qualification. The famous paragraph beginning agit enimu traque forma, each form, each natural kind, works or operates or behaves according to its nature. So this solution created a few problems. It created the impression, rightly or wrongly, that the union of divinity and humanity in Christ was external rather than internal. There's one person walking around in Palestine, even if there are two agencies going on inside him. You need to say a bit more than that. It also gives the unhappy impression that the agent is not the person, but the nature, the kind. Broadly speaking, the Alexandrian tradition in response to this identifies the union as being kathipostasin. That is, the union at the level of the subsistent acting reality. So what is one in Jesus of Nazareth is that subsisting, specific agent identified as the word of God. And that at least clarifies the question of agency, but leaves you with the awkward problem of whether that means that the natures of the divine and the human become indistinguishable in the activity of Jesus. Forgive my going over what is Christology 101 for some people, but it gets a little bit more interesting, I hope, later on. So both styles of dealing with the question have uncomfortable implications. Both leave you with questions about the difference between speaking of subsistent agents and speaking of kinds, natures, forms, or whatever you want to call them. There's the awkward implication in the Alexandrian model that the relationship of the Word of God to his divine nature and the relationship to his human nature are the same. One subsistent simply has two parallel tracks of existing and acting, which interact and are ascribable to the same agent. But is that an adequate version of the relation of person to nature in the Trinity? Ex hypothesi, the divine hypostasis, the divine subsistent of the word, is identical with the divine nature in its intrinsic, eternal interdependence with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And any hypostasis, any subsistent of a human nature, 
would be an instant instance of an ensemble of human qualities. And the divine person can't be an instance of divine qualities. Well, the Council of Chalcedon in 451 achieves a very remarkable exercise in plate spinning. It manages to keep the vocabulary of both these solutions mostly in play and manages to create a very precarious but not entirely nonsensical balance between them. It borrows formulae from both sides to make its point. It insists on the oneness of the agent. It insists on both the indivisibility and the inconfused, unconfused, unmixed nature of the natures. But like most settlement formulae, it offers an agenda rather than a solution. The apparently simple structure, a divine subsistent stroke hypostasis person exemplifying both divine and human natures, is a lot less straight straightforward on analysis than it first seems. And what's recognised within a century or so of that council is the need for a sophisticated refinement of the sense of this key word hypostasis, the active subsistent reality, the particular agent word. And that will take a good 200 years of further conceptual development to get anything like clear. So, as um, in the first of these lectures, I invite you to either take a deep breath and prepare for a little bit of technical floundering or to switch off for <laughs> 15 minutes or so. But the key point in this process of refinement between the middle of the 5th and the middle of the 7th century is the acknowledgement that the word hypostasis, subsistent, isn't simply a term that designates an ultimate internal subjecthood of some kind. It's a much more heuristic concept than that. Its reference is whatever it is that constitutes some phenomenon, a continuous and integral subject of predicates. That's a mouthful, I did warn you. Whatever it is that constitutes some phenomenon, a continuous and integral subject of predicates. And once you've got that, it's possible to see how you can use that word in the context of Christology in two ways that at first sight seem a bit inconsistent. Starting from the divine, as it were, as if we ever could, but for the sake of argument, starting from the divine, we could rightly say the eternal word is the sole hypostasis in the identity of Jesus of Nazareth. The one subsistent actual agent in Jesus of Nazareth is the second person of the Trinity. There is no other ultimate source of active presence and power except that divine word. And for this to be true, the word must be what it is independently of any external condition. What we are talking about is the second subsistent reality within the divine life consubstantial with the Father, identified as distinct within the divine life solely as that life which is generated by the Father to reflect and return to the Father what has been bestowed upon it and to impart that life by making the space in which the Spirit operates. That's what we're talking about. No state of affairs in the world makes this true. It is eternally and definitionally true. It's a specification of how the Christian God is to be identified. That's what we mean when we talk about the eternal divine word. But, at the same time, from the world's point of view, what makes the phenomenon of Jesus of Nazareth identifiable as a continuous subject is a collection of predicates that are made true by states of affairs in the world. Jesus is the word incarnate doesn't tell us how pragmatically and historically we might identify Jesus of Nazareth. And so the theologian has to say that the one hypostasis, the one subsistent reality of the incarnate is both the eternal and simple reality of the word 
and the composite reality that is the individual Jesus of Nazareth as identified as, as animated by the word. And if this echoes for you the discussion that I introduced you to in the first of these lectures about the unity of essay in Jesus, in St. Thomas Aquinas, this is where that story begins. We have to find a way of saying that the animated, word-embodying substance of Jesus of Nazareth is a composite reality in which created agency is real and distinct, a real part of the finite world, while not saying that this human substance contributes anything to what the second person of the Trinity eternally and definitionally is. And that's rather hard work. These are the questions, though, that are being worked through in Byzantine theology of the 6th century, especially in the work of the two Leontii, confusingly Leontius of Jerusalem and Leontius of Byzantium. Somebody should have told them, really. <laughs> Leontius of Byzantium contributes to the discussion the helpful clarification that no nature, no kind of being, can exist without being hypostatized. Natures don't just lie around. They are embodied, instantiated, particularized. So the condition of any natural kind that is operative in the world is what Leontius calls enhypostasia. That is the condition of being made subsistent, the condition of being actually present as an identifiable agent. There's no such thing as a nature in the world. No such thing, that is. But that doesn't mean that wherever you find a distinct nature, you find a distinct hypostasis. A nature can be made actual, can be hypostatized, by an agency that isn't exclusively its own. Leontius compares this, and of course, as we've seen, it's a popular move in patristic Christology. Leontius compares this with the way in which body and soul unite. Body and soul are enhypostatized together. They, body and soul are made actual by being not separate substances, but the one substance that is a human individual. Their natures are radically different, but they come together in one active presence, one subsistent. And this, says Leontius, is exactly what we affirm about human nature in its relation to the eternal word. It's neither that an active instance of human nature has to have an ultimately human ground for its being what it is, nor that an individual of another nature somehow supplants the principle of individuality in this instance of humanity. Yet again, not a competitive relation. The unique, actually subsisting reality that is God the Word, in full communion with Father and Spirit, fully identical with the divine life as far as its qualities go, actively constitutes this human substance as an active, identifiable presence in the world. Without that constitutive agency, that human substance would be anhypostatic. It would lack the actual subsistence it has. Again, you'll hear the foreshadowing here of the medieval argument that we looked at a few weeks ago. Leontis of Jerusalem spells this out a bit further in asserting that to be independently hypostatic, to be a real subsistent, is also to be diastatic and apostatic. Wonderful language, Greek. That is, to be distinct and distant, separable. If the humanity of Jesus is inseparably held in a relation to the eternal word, a relation of unbroken dependence, it cannot be distant, independent of relation. It can't just be a human individuality and nothing more. In such a context, it's possible to see how and why hypostasis as a word can be used both of the word of God as such, second person of the Trinity, and of the complex finite phenomenon in its entirety, that is Jesus of Nazareth, the savior of the world. So it is still true to say that one of the Trinity suffered in the flesh, a formula that Leontius of Jerusalem endorses wholeheartedly. 
There's no break in action between the word and the subject that is Jesus. And so we can rightly say that nobody other than the word is being referred to in any account of what Jesus suffers. Who suffers the driving in of the nails and the crown of thorns? Who but the word of God? Because the who of Jesus is wholly continuous with that eternal reality. Does that mean that the word of God suffers as God? No, you clearly haven't been listening, Leontius would say, because the whole point is that the way in which the word of God suffers and can suffer is as human. That's the point. There is no mysterious occult kind of divine suffering. There is the actual suffering of flesh and blood human beings. That's what we're talking about. And this point is something which I think is still quite difficult to get across in theological debate these days, when a certain kind of well-meaning theological sentimentality affirms that you must deny impassibility of God, because if God only suffers in the human nature of Jesus, that's really not good enough. The point, though, is the suffering we're talking about is human suffering. That's the kind of suffering that matters in this context, and that's why one of the Trinity suffered in the flesh. It would be wrong to say the word suffers in his divine nature, not just because of squeamishness about the appropriateness of speaking of God's suffering, as I said at the beginning of this lecture, but because something would then be admitted into the definition of what it means to be God that would be dependent on how things stood in the world, and that would be a fundamental confusion of categories. And yet again, the idea that Jesus instantiates a composite nature, with two contributing natures making up a third kind of life, divine human, in one word, that won't do either, because that would mean you had two components dependent on each other for constituting a third. And that again would mean the divine nature was under the necessity of combining with the human nature in order to produce a composite nature, which would yet again entail that something was true about God that depended on finite facts. <clears throat> so, surfacing for a breath of air for a moment, this is the background against which the greatest of all Byzantine theologians, Maximus the Confessor, begins to work out his own very distinctive synthesis. And in what's left of this lecture, I want to look at Maximus really in three phases. I want to look at what he says specifically following through these insights of the Leontii. I want to look at how that connects with aspects of his cosmology, his Christ-centred cosmology, and I want finally to look at how that informs and illuminates what he says about the Christian life, the Christian community, and indeed the community of created beings, in order to lead this back to my focal concern about the logic of creation. Maximus gives something like a definitive or classical shape to the general theological approach that Leontius of Byzantium and Leontius of Jerusalem outline. His vast corpus of work defies intelligent selective quotation, so you're going to have fairly unintelligent selective quotation in the rest of the lecture, and I apologise for that, but it's taking quite a while to get all of his works in critical editions and know exactly where you can go for details, so forgive a rather thin trail of reference. I'll do my best. Two of his letters, 13 and 15, and some of the items in the collection known as the Opuscula Theologica de Polemica, the short theological and controversial treatises, spell this out in particular of detail. Maximus accepts the 4th century distinction associated with the Cappadocian Fathers, the distinction of hypostasis as relating to the particular and usia essence to the common or general, and he follows through the Leontian argument about how nature needs to be hypostatized. Nature doesn't lie around, it's got to be instantiated concretely and actively. He agrees with the Leontii that hypostatization doesn't require a hypostasis exclusive to that nature. It's possible to be given active subsistence by 
an agency other than belongs to your own nature. But he brings to the debate two significant new elements. The first is a distinction between what he calls logos and tropos. It's a distinction which can be mapped onto, but is not quite the same as the nature and hypostasis distinction. Very, very broadly speaking, logos is the structure of a reality, the given synchronic structure. Tropos is the diachronic story of an agent or a subsistent, what it does, what happens to it, how it operates. Logos leaning towards the abstract, this is the structure we're always dealing with, the given. Tropos leaning more to the concrete. But as you'll see, the way in which those terms are used interweaves in quite a, an interesting way. <coughs> A nature in action is defined in its operation, the way it works, by a set of basic constraints. An active nature, a nature that is hypostatized, shows a pattern of internal consistency that makes it a substance of this kind rather than another. And that set of basic constraints is roughly what Maximus calls the logos of the nature. Logos is physios. But in its operation, it's identified also in terms of its specific performance, as we might say. If it's a rational substance, it's identified by the succession of choices it makes. This is the tropos, the way, the mode, in which the particular set of constraints is actualized. The French Dominican scholar Antoine Lévy puts it very well and very simply by saying logos and tropos in any subsistent reality can be distinguished as the invariable and the variable. The invariable set of constraints, the variable acting out of what kind of being we're talking about. And that, of course, allows Maximus to explain rather neatly why sin may be a, an enormous problem, but it doesn't alter human nature. The definition of humanity is not changed by sin. The logos of human nature is as it was in Adam. Our problem is, so to speak, tropical. It's the way we do it. It also allows him to explain why nature itself, human nature itself, can be raised to a new status, a new mode of operating, without its basic structure being changed. The glorified, sanctified human nature of the saints is as human as yours and mine, which is a bit of a problem because it would be quite nice to think that being human was being just like us and we needn't bother about anything further. But our human nature can be transfigured without ceasing to be human. A specific set of transformative events is at work in opening up what's possible tropically, in mode, in style, in action for human nature, without changing the underlying set of constraints. Now, you won't be surprised to know that there's still quite a lot of scholarly debate about how the detail of this structure works. One of the maddening things about Maximus is that he never sits down and writes a systematic treatise explaining all his vocabulary in detail. He writes occasional works. He writes letters. He writes pamphlets. He writes reflections for monks. And the poor, beleaguered reader of Maximus has to piece together the connections with uh, quite a bit of effort, but it's all there. I have a vivid recollection some years ago when I was part of the Anglican Orthodox International Dialogue team and Metropolitan John Zizulus of Pergamon, that great man, was the chair of the Orthodox side of the dialogue and he and I fell into debate about the interpretation of a passage in Maximus. This was in Bucharest, and after about an hour or so of utterly inconclusive debate, we sent out for a copy of Maximus the Confessor's complete works from the Patriarchal Library, and Metropolitan John and myself were left together with the works of Maximus the Confessor while the rest of the commission went to lunch, <laughs> and were told basically and rather brutally to sort it out between us. But it's that kind of problem that Maximian scholarship constantly lends you with. <laughs>
But for all the debate about detail, we can summarize what Maximus is after roughly in these terms. As we've seen, the eternal word of God, the second person of the Trinity, is distinguished not by any thing, by any modification of that set of definitional properties which is the divine nature. The eternal word is distinguished by the way in which divine nature actually lives in and as the word. The word is distinguished eternally by the way it is divine. This is one way of living Godhead. And that tropos, that way of being God, is in this instance what we call filial. It's the mode of dependence upon the fatherly source. That's the way God is God as word. God is God as father in the mode of what you might call bottomless bestowal of reality and life. God is God as word in unremitting, unconstrained response to that gift. And that eternal and irreducible way of living the divine life, which is the word of God, that is what gives substantial and active presence to the humanity that is Jesus of Nazareth in the historical world. And the set of definitional constraints, the invariables that make Jesus count as a human individual, remain unaffected by this fact. The logos of his humanity is unchanged. But the humanity of Jesus is actualized or exercised, or however you want to put it, in a mode, a tropos, perfectly continuous with the word's way of being God. So, the way God is God, as word, the filial mode, is the way in which Jesus is human, a filial mode. Jesus is son to the Father in a way that is completely continuous with the eternal word's relation to the Father. That's what we mean by saying there is a logos of each nature, but a tropos here that is one. And Antoine Levy, to quote him once again, um, calls this an une identité de comportement, an identity of comportment, wonderful French word, an identity of, what do you say, a style of behaviour, an identity of, translating loosely, comportment in his divine nature and his human nature, an identity characterised by the filial relationship to a heavenly father. So that Logos-Tropos distinction is one of Maximus's great contributions to the dis discussion. It's a refinement of what we might mean by talking about hypostasis in nature. It helpfully introduces what Levy sums up as the invariable versus variable pattern of what we're talking about. It allows you to say that what happens to the humanity of Jesus does not stop it being human in this instance, but allows that humanity to operate divinely. Now, Maximus then has to deal with a consequent problem of some complexity. Cyril of Alexandria, who is the greatest theological authority in some ways in this period, and the pseudo-Dionysius, who is regarded as a quasi-apostolic authority in the period, both of them use language about one operation or action, one eneria in Christ. And despite Maximus' uns unswerving commitment to the dogmatic principle that there are two energies, modes of operation in Christ, he feels obliged to defend the language of Cyril and Dionysius. And he achieves this by distinguishing, and you'll find this in um, the Opuscula Theologica, number 20, a distinguishing between activation as the principle of an event, the actual moving force, and what results from this, the actuality of the event itself. So, there is one hypostatic agent in whose historical action or manifestation two kinds of agency are inseparably united. Thus there are two natural energies, two ways of being, exercised by one agent, but the exercise of those energies is indivisible. The gradually developing concept, which we've already touched on, of a composite hypostasis, 
laying the foundation for the medieval concept of the composite essay, allows Maximus to maintain what I'd like to call the binocular perspective here, affirming the singleness of agency in the incarnate word and the duality of kinds of agency. It's a coherent and lucid corrective to the language of Pope Leo about natures as sort of agents. What Maximus is saying is there are two logoi, two sets of constraints that we recognize in the phenomenon of Jesus. And to speak of a set of constraints is to speak of the kind of operation which allows you to recognize this agent as that kind of agent or that kind of agent. Two energies. And also, though I won't go into detail about this, two wills. But here we move to the second distinctive contribution made by Maximus, which takes me to the next bit of my take on Maximus' theology. It's a contribution which fills out the structure still further and allows us to read his Christology in the context of his entire sense of created reality. This contribution is his understanding of the cosmological relation between the eternal word and the structures of created things. Or, to turn to the terms of my title this evening, the relation between logos and logoi, between the word of God, the structure of God's mind and act, and the logoi, the structure, structures, the intelligible structures of finite reality. The eternal life of God as active and creative intelligence in the eternal word is the ground and the context, the active principle of every distinct structure of intelligible life making up the finite universe, the ensemble of all natures. So for anything to be an intelligible, coherent, consistent, understandable, continuous, reality, for anything to have a nature, is for it to be grounded in the intelligent and intelligible act of God as outgoing in the Logos. Antoine Levy once again, he very helpfully explains in his enormous treatise on uh, being at essence in Maximus and Aquinas, that the concept of a Logos of nature, Logos is physios, is already around in the late classical period. And in late Alexandrian Platonism, the logos of a nature denoted the ideal state from which finite actuality had declined. So in philosophy of the period, the notion of a logos was that of an ideal condition, lost in the complexities of finite action and event. But, says Levy, what Maximus does is to redefine this, to mean not an ideal state, a sort of paradisal perfection now lost, but an inner regulatory principle, almost, you might say, an inner homing device, which leads finite substances towards their optimal level of actualization. So instead of being a lost perfection, Logos becomes a direction of travel towards fulfillment. And it's that dynamism about the notion of Logos in Maximus that is his most original contribution to theology overall, and specifically to the idea of Christology as foundational for a doctrine of creation. An inner regulatory principle, a homing device, that dynamic inner movement leading finite substances to an optimal level of actualization. Each finite reality contains at its base or in its ground something that is making for a state of affairs in which that reality is most fully itself. <laughs> and as Levy puts it, the journey to or return to the Logoi does not define for the creature a movement towards an origin from which it has fallen away, but towards a goal which it has yet to attain.
the more a creature moves towards its optimal actuality, its logos, the closer it is to the creator. The more a creature becomes itself, the closer it is to God. And the harmonious diversity of the created order, when it's acting as it should, reflects the unity of the eternal word, the eternal logos, in whom are all the multiple modes in which eternal being and intelligibility can be mirrored in finite reality. So, specifically, for humanity to be fully human is for humanity to be aligned with its logos, its basic set of constraints, and so with the logos. But that means for humanity to be steadily on the way towards an optimal relationship with the Logos, which is at the very same time its own optimal human condition. And what makes humanity unique in creation is that it's created with the capacity to mediate the Logos' own unifying agency within creation. Human beings are made in the image of the eternal Logos. The Logos integrates, holds together, and as Maximus and others would say, liturgizes the whole of creation, makes the whole of creation sacramental of the divine gift. Humanity reflects that integrating, liturgizing quality. For us to be fully human is for us to be engaged actively and prayerfully in the reconciliation of all things, the holding together of creation directed towards God. Humanity's vocation, in other words, is not just to be optimally or maximally human in the sense of exemplifying natural human qualities as perfectly as possible. Humanity's vocation is to be actively engaged in the harmonizing of the created order as part of a liturgical service offered to God. We could put this a bit more loosely by saying that for Maximus, the calling of humanity is to be freely active in a certain way to be more than just natural. Human nature is itself when it's not simply human nature. Human nature is itself when it is personalized in gift, in prayer, and in the whole reconciliatory activity that Maximus sees as key to the redeemed order. Where this vocation has been refused and overlaid by human sin, what has to be restored is the capacity of finite human agents to choose and act as they should. And so when the hypostasis, the subsistent eternal reality of the Logos, takes on human identity in Jesus, it will render human nature capable of a new level of hypostatic personal agency in respect of the whole entire created order. Now what I think is most interesting in terms of the history of Christology is that Maximus here is saying a good deal more than what many historians of theology recognize in patristic accounts of redemption. It's sometimes been argued, it's argued very eloquently for example by Professor Daphne Hampson, that the patristic scheme depends entirely on unreconstructed Platonism. That is, it depends on the idea that there is something called human nature that Christ restores, as well like that. Christ restores human nature as a general reality which exists independently of specific individuals. Christ, so to speak, injects into the metaphysical DNA of humanity a new element. Now, there are plenty of trends and idioms in patristic theology which could lead you to think that that was indeed what was being talked about. But we've already seen that such an extreme realism about universals, natures in general, was not in fact held by the theologians we've been looking at. They're all pretty clear, there is no such thing as human nature. So we can't simply write off all of this as an outmoded and indefensible Platonism. Redemptive transformation for the Byzantine theologians is indeed the transformation of nature considered as the defining set of human qualities. But, despite the looser language of some earlier writers, it's not a bare injection of divine qualities into human nature that achieves this. 
The eternal Logos' way of exercising or living the divine nature is what now animates this particular human substance. But in animating as it does this human substance, Jesus of Nazareth, in hypostatizing humanity as Jesus of Nazareth, it creates a new set of relations between humanity and divine life, precisely in and through the unique humanity that is Christ's. That's to say the story of redemption is not the story of some magical recreation of human nature. It's the story of the creation of supernatural personal relation through the person of Christ. The relations thus created become the vehicle for a new level of transformative engagement with the cosmos at large. In personal union with the incarnate Logos, human agents are enabled to act as they are meant to in regard to their entire human and non-human environment. So for the Logos, the word to be united to the Logos is physios, the structure of humanity, is for a human substance to be activated by the divine agency, exercising its divine physis in the distinct mode of filiation. The humanity of Jesus is drawn out beyond its static properties into an ecstatic relation with the Father, into a radically self-emptied, other-directed love. Now it's true, as one um, impressive recent writer, um, the Finnish scholar Turunen, has said, it's true that some of Maximus's interpreters have elaborated this into a metaphysic which opposes fixed natures to self-transcending persons. As he says, some of Maximus's modern readers have read rather too much Jean-Paul Sartre on the route to the Byzantine world. And that's not quite what Maximus has in mind. Undoubtedly, he sees nature itself as endowed with an appropriate degree of freedom. He doesn't think of nature in a kind of Sartrean way as the realm of necessity and impersonality. But it's also true, and here I'm moving towards the third and last bit of my reading of Maximus, it's also true that he treats ecstasy, ecstasis, as the proper culmination of humanity's growth towards God. Ecstasy is the condition in which the knowing, finite subject goes beyond its given limits, including the natural limits of self-preservation. And that ecstasy is generated by eros. And that's a term Maximus uses without embarrassment as designating the magnetic drawing of finite beings towards the infinite. So for Christ to live in the believer is for the believer to be caught up into the self-abandoning love, both of the Son, or the Word, for the Father, and of God for the creation. The standing outside, the pouring outside of self, the ecstatic action and love of the divine, pulls out us from ourselves, our own ecstatic, erotic passion for the divine. In both creation and incarnation, God has elected to dwell within the created order without stopping being God. Maximus takes that as axiomatic, and you'll find that most conveniently in one of the great anthologies of axioms from his work, the so-called centuries, which appear in the spiritual collection, the Philokalia. That's um, the fifth century on theology and economy sections 85 to 6. Economy here incidentally meaning the, the act of God for salvation, not the kind of thing you read about in the newspapers. The entire relation of infinite to finite is, he says, a movement of desire, eros. That is, it's a moving beyond what the intellect can master and a growth in love. God's very nature, God's essence, is transcendence. It is to go beyond, it is to go outside, it is to be other directed. That's what the Trinitarian life is all about. And so, as we are drawn towards the Trinitarian life and the Trinitarian desire, the eros between the three persons of the Trinity, they're outgoing towards one another, their mutual ecstasies, 
So our humanity is transformed into an erotic, a desiring, an ecstatic, a standing outside kind of living. Incidentally, the, the use of eros for the relations between the persons of the Trinity isn't, I think, a phrase you find in Maximus himself, but it is a phrase which does occur in so many words in later medieval Byzantine thought, especially in Gregory Palinus in the 14th century. That's another story. But this goes a bit further. This growth in ecstatic love, which we're drawn into in our allegiance to and identification with Christ, manifests itself also as an overcoming, quote from Maximus, an overcoming of the divisions now prevailing in nature because of man's self-love. All this eros and ecstasy stuff actually overcomes the rivalries, the hostilities between human subjects. It enables us, says Maximus, to recognize one another in a new way, at a new level. And in the wake of this erotic, ecstatic reconciliation with God, the community of finite agents becomes more and more solidly established, he says, in justice, as human beings recognize more fully in one another their common nature. They recognize one another as rational and intellectual beings. And in Maximus's context, that doesn't simply mean they recognize one another as <coughs> potential junior research fellows. It means they recognize in one another exactly the kind of freedom for unbounded relation that intellect understanding is fundamentally about. To say we're intellectual is to say we're capable of being drawn into relation with what is not us, being drawn out of ourselves in that relation which is an indwelling of the object and the subject and the subject and the object. That's being intellectual, whatever it may look like. So, the paradox is that the universal rationality Maximus talks about really means the universal realization of ecstasy. If we are indeed held in relationship with the incarnate word in this way, if our humanity is transfigured without ceasing to be human so that we can act in other directed love for everyone and everything in their diverse conditions, then we are fully human, but also participants in God's way of being. And we, to use a lovely phrase from Maximus, we belong not to ourselves, but to those whom we love. A phrase which for Maximus applies boldly to God, as it does to us. God belongs not to God's self, but to those whom God loves, and we likewise and mutually. So I think it's essential in trying to get a grasp of Maximus's Christology to see its close links with this ethical and spiritual agenda. The doctrinal pattern, human nature realized in a particular mode by the presence in the finite world of divinity lived out as affiliation, is inseparably connected with the pattern of a restored creation in which humanity actualizes its long obscured potential for establishing just relationship and reconciliation among the diverse forms of earthly existence. Our association with Christ through the work of the Spirit in church and sacraments and contemplation does away with the kind of self-preoccupation that impedes both love and prayer. We are activated by a divine action that is eternally moving out towards the other. The love of the Word as the eternal Son of the Father, the love of the whole Trinity for creation. And the logic of creation in this context is that the immeasurable diversity and interwoven complexity of the finite order is destined to be drawn into harmony and mutual life sharing through the reconciliation of humanity to God. That reconciliation is achieved in the self-emptying act of incarnation, which draws us into self-emptying and self-transcending faith and prayer. And the natural byproduct of that is universal justice. My title speaks of a Byzantine breakthrough. It's partly that Maximus stands at the culmination 
of a longish process of conceptual refinement in which the language of Chalcedon receives what was to become its classical interpretation. And as we have seen, it takes the shape which was then transmitted to the medieval West, foreshadowing the analysis offered by Aquinas of what it means to ascribe a single essay to Jesus, with all that this means in dismantling the notion of a competitive divine human relation. But, at least as importantly, Maximus has unfolded a positive account of that finite infinite relation in terms of the divine rationality, both generally as the Logos grounding the orderly interdependence of creatures and so shared in by creatures, and specifically as an order that is restored and transcended in the interdependence of selfless love that is embodied in the incarnate Christ. Divine Eros, divine outpouring in purposeful action towards creation, an outpouring rooted in the eternal relation of the divine hypostases, generates created Eros towards God, which in turn generates the ecstasis of contemplative love, which most fully realises the human vocation in the context of the rest of finite being. Precisely because the divine hypostasis, the word, is what it is, that is divine, and thus without any ground for withholding love, and filial, and thus eternally related to the Father, its action draws finite agency into itself, not as if into another, a dominant and alien other, but into its own deepest capacity. Our Logos of nature, Logos de Schizios, is realised when we become most fully ourselves, and that becoming most fully ourselves is becoming most fully in tune with the divine agency and participating in it. Our own deepest capacity, our own own most reality, is to be aligned with the divine action. And as we return in next week's lecture to the Western context, we'll see, I hope, how this spiritual and corporate mystical and political dimension of Christological thinking, still clearly discernible in Aquinas, rather goes off the boil in the later Middle Ages. And we'll see also how it was rescued by, among others, that unlikeliest of displaced Greek fathers, John Calvin. <laughs> Take a couple of questions. There are any? Who would you like to relate Maximus to Dante? <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to. <laughs> As so often, David, with your questions, I'm, I'm inclined to say, I'd love to hear you do it. <laughs> But Dante, yes, um, of course, the two features of Dante which seem most obviously to resonate with what I've been talking about are, I suppose, the, the whole sense of the gradations of desire and the affirmation of desire level by level, finding their, their ultimate logic and coherence in the love of God. And in that final image of the Paradiso, the sense of interlocking or interweaving created particularities bound in a sort of infinite filigree of interrelation held together by the act of God at the heart of it all. I'd need a copy of the Paradiso to hand, I think, to spell that out, but those are the two things which seem to me most evidently part of the same story and part of, I suppose, what um, Dante, gets, Dante gets through Aquinas. But uh, do say more because I have to pursue it. How relevant is Sergei Bulgakov's critique 
uh, of the patristic Christological legacy that there has to be a condition of possibility in the Trinity, not only for assuming Logoi, but for assuming sinful Logoi, and that implies, in the case of humans, uh, who by their sinfulness are sufferers, uh, a moment of suffering in the, the reality of the world. Mm. Ooh, how long have you got? <laughs> and that's, that's a really interesting question. Um, Bulgakov, I think, handles all this with colossal subtlety. But I'm not quite persuaded. I think there is still in Bulgakov a touch of that sheerly romantic interest in the divine suffering, the divine pathos, which I have some qualms about. What, as I read him, Bulgakov is saying um, is something a bit like this. In a very important sense, we cannot talk about God as absolute. We can only talk about God as the absolute in relation to the relative. We can only talk about God in relation. And that means, of course, that whatever could conceivably ever be said about God as absolute must mean that the absolute, the unspeakable absolute, contains the possibility of relation. That's a, a fair point, I think that's a good, a good place to start. I think Bulgakov then gets himself in a bit of a tangle over this. I, as you will know, have the deepest respect for Bulgakov's theology. But I think the legacy of Schelling, the legacy of a particular kind of 19th century German pathos-related language, does rather get to him here. And he does use quite extreme language about the, um, the relations of the persons of the Trinity as if it's not only a matter of unconditional self-bestowing or self-sharing, but what he notably calls at one point a self-devastation, a kind of massive metaphysical suicide that's going on. And that's where I begin scratching my head rather. Interestingly, um, that other uh, great, great Russian theologian, Antony Bloom, although he often said how much he disliked Bulgakov, <laughs> he uses quite similar language in his own um, preaching about the Trinity. And um, that interests me a lot because, among other things, I, I think it shows that um, the Russian tradition, rather like uh, the flow of water, takes whatever path is available and find its way, finds its way through. And of course, behind Bulgakov is also the mid 19th century figure of <coughs> Philolet of Moscow, talking about the eternal crucifixion within the Trinity. So Bulgakov does have some hinterland here, and it's very seductive, but I do think I'd want to keep pressing a bit on whether there isn't a degree of hmm, uneasy or unhelpful fascination with pathos in it. Maximus and Dante and Bulgakov. I think we've had a pretty full plate. And I think that's the hour. We'll thank uh, our speaker once more. Thank you.